Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halady. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those yuck-yuck nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, an interview I have so been looking forward to with Professor Celine Marie Pascal of American University in Washington, D.C. Professor Pascal is a sociologist who did a study of mainstream media coverage in the first two years after Fukushima. Not only are her observations stunning and complete alignment with what we've been saying in the movement all this time, she's got the data to back it up. That interview plus our ever-popular Num Nuts of the Week, activist shout-outs, and the Daily Show Twitter campaign, plus more nuclear information than Hillary Clinton has yet managed to put into her campaign materials. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, May 12th, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. We start with this piece of exceptionally good news. An appeals court has overturned the sabotage convictions of 85-year-old Sister Megan Rice and two fellow peace activists who broke into the Y-12 National Security Complex in Oak Ridge to reach a uranium storage bunker. In a two-to-one opinion issued on Friday, May 7th, a panel of the 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals overturned the most serious conviction against Sister Rice, as well as 66-year-old Michael Wally and 59-year-old Greg Bortia Obed. The court did uphold a conviction for injuring government property, which is curious because you can only injure a person. Property is damaged. People are injured. What did these three peace activists do that got them sentences of between three and five years? They cut through a chain-link fence to enter the site, walked around, spray-painted graffiti, strung crime scene tape, hung banners, prayed, and hammered on the outside wall of the bunker to symbolize a biblical passage that refers to the end of war. Quote, they will beat their swords into plowshares. The trio also sprayed the exterior of the complex with baby bottles containing human blood which had been donated to them in the will of a dying co-activist. When a guard approached, they offered him food and started singing. The entire incident took two hours. The trio were also found guilty of causing more than $1,000 of damage to government property. And given the inflated way that the government computes its finances, it probably wasn't anywhere close to that. At the trial, Sister Megan said her only regret was waiting so long to stage her protest. She said, It is manufacturing that which can only cause death. As a result of her actions, U.S. lawmakers and the Department of Energy launched an inquiry and uncovered what they called troubling displays of ineptitude at the facility. Yeah, think? Top officials were reassigned, including the National Nuclear Security Administration. WSI, the company providing security at the site, was dismissed and other officers were sacked, demoted, or suspended. Now, Sister Rice's attorney, Bill Quigley, says he hopes the three will be resentenced to time served and released from prison. Amen to that. Big news out of New York. There was an explosion at the Indian Point nuclear power plant in New York, just 40 miles north of New York City. The blaze, started by a transformer, sent black smoke billowing into the sky and set off alarms and a loudspeaker message that said, this is not a drill. The blast sent the facility into an emergency response situation classified by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as an unusual event, the first of four levels of dangerous situation at a nuclear facility. But it wasn't so unusual that there is a transformer fire at Indian Point because this is the third one that has occurred in the last 10 years. 
And while the fire was put out on Thursday, as of Friday, May 10, after being extinguished, the fire was apparently reignited by the heat of the transformer. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo pointed out that the Indian Point nuclear power plant is a stone's throw from one of the most densely populated urban areas on the planet. We've had too many emergencies of late. The Unit 3 reactor at Indian Point is now in shutdown and is expected to remain that way for weeks. But the fallout from the fire, you should pardon the expression, continues because it's been learned that for some reason, Indian Point got a special fire safety exemption from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Richard Brodsky, an attorney who is also a former 14-term New York State Assemblyman and someone who has successfully challenged Indian Point on a range of issues, said, There is no question that Indian Point fails to meet the NRC's own fire safety standards. The way the NRC deals with that is it issues exemptions to its own standards. Several years ago, Indian Point requested and received an exemption that cut by more than half the amount of protection required for electrical cables used to shut down a reactor in case of a fire. Governor Cuomo nailed it when he said, So if the transformer fire had spread, my question is, what could we have done? They had trouble putting out the fire. A fire spreading at a nuclear plant, you have a very real problem. You think? This fire places a new level of scrutiny on the Spectra Energy gas pipeline, which is being proposed to be built virtually adjacent to Indian Point. Linda Puglisi who is town supervisor of Cortland, a town next to Indian Point, said that the gas pipeline should be scrapped after the Indian Point accident. She said, if this explosion and fire had been in close proximity to this new expanded gas line, it could have been a disaster. There's a terrific article by Carl Grossman up on counterpunch.org. It's called, Our Nuke is Burning! We'll have a link to it up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 203. And last word on Indian Point, there is an alarmist video going around online that talks about Indian Point blows up. Sorry, guys, it's an alarmist piece. It is a gross exaggeration, and really, the problem is bad enough. We don't have to get dramatic and make it sound worse. But wait, there's more bad news for nukes on the East Coast. The Oyster Creek nuclear power plant in New Jersey remains shut down for the fifth day as of Monday, May 11th, as staff work to solve the electric problem that sent it offline. The shutdown took place last Thursday night, the same day as the Indian Point transformer fire, And the NRC said on Friday that the trouble originated from a main electric transformer outside the reactor building, the same as at Indian Point. Oyster Creek is the oldest nuclear power plant in the country, having opened in 1969. Owner Exelon announced in 2010 that it would close the plant in 2019, which would be its 50th year in operation. No, no, no. Put it out of its misery. Shoot it now. A point two nuclear power plant on Lake Ontario offline this morning because pumps that circulate water through the reactor shut off while being shifted to a lower speed. Now, the reactor was not affected and remains at 100 percent power. The plant has been operating at about 78 percent power since last week as crews made repairs to the feed water heating system. It will remain shut off until all repairs have been made. Shut it down forever now. In Ohio, a steam leak at Davis Bessie shut that nuke down on Saturday night. And just downstream from Three Mile Island on the Susquehanna River, biologists have confirmed the first case of cancer in a smallmouth bass. Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission biologists say they've observed sores and lesions on many smallmouth bass in surveys of the river since 2005, but this is the first confirmed cancer. Meanwhile, 
The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission is going to revise how it assesses foreign ownership of U.S. nuclear facilities, making it more possible for countries other than the United States to own and or control nukes on our soil. But what could go wrong? This week, the U.S. House of Representatives approved over $300 million for a mixed oxide fuel fabrication facility. Try saying that five times real fast. At Savannah River site in South Carolina. Despite calls from watchdog groups to gut a program that has fallen far behind schedule, exceeded its budget, and has no real customers. But other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, what did you think of the play? In 2004, construction for the site was estimated to cost $1.6 billion and was expected to be completed by 2007. But now, more than $4 billion has been spent on construction, which is only 67% complete, and the site has lost its contract with its only real customer, Duke Energy. That happened in 2008, and they haven't been able to find a replacement buyer for the fuel product yet. Didn't they do any marketing research before they built this thing? Where was Shark Tank when we needed them? A new congressionally mandated report estimates that the life cycle costs for this facility will skyrocket to more than $114 billion. And in order to complete the project, we'll need at least $500 million a year. As Kevin O'Leary would say, don't throw good money after bad. I'm out. You're dead to me. Would that it were that easy. Let's take it away from the nuked out east and bring it to southeastern Utah, where radon releases have been found to skyrocket at the White Mesa Mill. New data reveals that emissions of radon, a radioactive, invisible, odorless, cancer-causing gas, from the White Mesa Uranium Mill exceeds Clean Air Act standards by over 50 times the legal limit. According to Sarah Fields, Program Director of Uranium Watch, for decades the EPA claimed that the radon emissions at uranium mills were zero, so did not need to be determined or controlled. We now know that radon emissions are significant and must be monitored and controlled under CAA hazardous air pollution standards. Manuel Hart, tribal chairman from the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, said, Given the mill's vicinity to our White Mesa community, we are very concerned about the difference between the high levels of radon-222 emissions calculated by our environmental department and the low levels assumed by regulators. Indeed, despite being informed of the data in early February, neither EPA nor the Utah Department of Environmental Quality have formally responded to the Grand Canyon Trust and Uranium Watch's concerns nor have the regulators taken any enforcement actions to protect public health from the radon emissions released from the White Mesa Mill liquid wastes. Anne Mariah Tapp, Energy Program Director for the Grand Canyon Trust and a former nuclear hot seat interviewee on number 200, said, We consider this a potential public health emergency and are alarmed and disappointed by EPA's refusal to, at minimum, disprove our respective calculations. She went on, instead of taking immediate action, EPA continues to stall while public health hangs in question. And kudos and a Xena Warrior Princess Award to Las Vegas Mayor Carolyn Goodman, who says that she would lie down on U.S. Highway 95 to stop the transport of uranium waste through her city. I find it absolutely incredulous, the two-term mayor said while mangling the English language in a good cause. This is just not tolerable. The uranium waste is expected to pass through Las Vegas on its way to a landfill at the Nevada National Security Site, 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas. Federal officials are not expected to make the shipping schedule public, apparently derailing the mayor's threat to head off the transports. Yeah, but it's a great gesture. Last month, when Arnie Gunderson, 
chief engineer at Fairwinds Energy Education and one of our brightest lights, spoke at the World Uranium Symposium. He talked about significant amounts of Fukushima radiation having been detected on the west coast of North America. He said, last week, Woods Hole announced a study that showed about seven becquerels per cubic meter of radiation had reached the west coast of North America. They called it trace amounts. I don't call seven becquerels per cubic meter a trace amount. That's significant and measurable, and it's just the beginning of the onslaught. Ernie went on to explain, there was a study in 2012 that predicted how much radiation was going to get to the west coast of British Columbia. It was 29 times lower than what Woods Hole actually measured. So scientists have no clue about how to measure what's transporting through the ocean. Studies two years ago are already wrong by essentially a factor of 30. The scientists' real goal, Arnie said, was to downplay the significance of the damage to the Pacific Ocean. And speaking of the oceans, as the U.S. government continues to play head in the sand about the ongoing devastation to marine life in the Pacific, U.S. universities have begun testing animals for Fukushima radiation. Colorado State University is testing trace radiation samples in seal populations in the northern Pacific Ocean. And subsistence harvested ice seals and walruses are being tested by the University of Alaska Fairbanks Marine Advisory Program. Thus far, they have found disease conditions for the first time in the reproductive systems, endocrine, musculoskeletal, intergumentary, that means connective tissue, respiratory, and digestive systems in ice seals and walruses. But that's not the end of our nuclear woes for our waters, because... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, num nuts out of wake. Well, it gets no num nutsier than this. A panel of experts, and you know what I think about experts in the nuclear world, these Experts concluded that it is perfectly safe to bury hazardous nuclear waste material only 1.2 kilometers, meaning three-quarters of a mile, in a site near Lake Huron. Yes, our Great Lakes, the largest basin of fresh water in the world. And now Canada, Canada of all nations, has decided that it's okay to risk radiologic contamination of the drinking water for so many million people, I can't even find the number in front of me right now. But a Canadian environmental assessment concludes that burying the hazardous nuclear waste material near the shore of Lake Huron is the best way to deal with the waste. No, the best way to deal with the waste is not to make it in the first place. The 430-page report concludes the relative position of the proposed project within the spectrum of risks to the Great Lakes is a minor one. And the project is not likely to cause significant, I hate the use of that word that the nuclear industry loves so much, not likely to cause significant adverse environmental effects. I wonder how much it costs to get that conclusion out of this crew. More than 152 communities in Canada and the United States have condemned the plan. Beverly Fernandez, with the group Stop the Great Lakes Nuclear Dump, expressed deep disappointment with the panel's recommendation that the project be approved. Fernandez said, This is an intergenerational, nonpartisan issue that affects millions of Canadians and Americans. It is a decision that will affect the Great Lakes for the next 100,000 years. And the last place to bury and abandon radioactive nuclear waste is beside the largest supply of fresh water on the planet. Same Canadians who understood the danger found themselves represented in the statement of Mayor Kenneth Hobbs of Thunder Bay in Ontario. He said, I think it's a boneheaded move. You could see the lake almost a stone's throw away. Then he added, I think it's just the wrong location. You know, you're right. 
And what's the right location? How about one of the many sub-basements of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? Or Prime Minister of Canada Stephen Harper's bedroom, stored in unused space in Canada's Parliament, anywhere but not on the shores of Lake Huron. And that's why Canada, dudes, guys, wake up. You are this week's and possibly the next 100 millennia's nuclear hot seat. None that's not awake. In Japan, the bird population has been found to be in a tailspin four years after Fukushima, with mutations showing up that cause birds to be born blind and unable to fly. Dr. Tim Musso, professor of biological sciences at the University of South Carolina, reports that most organisms that he and his crew have examined show significantly increased rates of genetic damage in direct proportion to the level of exposure to radiation. Many organisms showed increased rates of deformities, developmental abnormalities, eye cataracts, and even tumors and cancers. Mousseau went on to say that bird species and abundances are in sharp decline, and the situation is getting worse. A story doing the rounds on the Internet seems to be good news, but bears closer examination. The headline from May 11th reads, U.S. restricts food import from Japan over radionuclide contamination concern. And it appears to include a list of Japanese food, that will be banned. This is undoubtedly being released at this time because of recent food scandals in Taiwan, where food from banned prefectures in Japan have been found to be part of the food supply, and also with the recent discovery of higher radiation levels in food in Hong Kong that have been imported from Japan. But is this release from the FDA anything meaningful? According to Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network's Kimberly Roberson, this is not new, meaning the release of this list of the FDA seems to be saying it's going to ban. She says, FDA has put this on their website since 2014. The issue is what they consider to be acceptable, which is 1,200 becquerels per kilogram, which is not acceptable. By contrast, Food in Japan that contains more than 100 becquerels of cesium per kilogram is illegal to be sold, which means that it's perfectly legal to export to the United States, and it will come in under our limit of 1,200, which, as Kimberly likes to point out, is a recommendation, not a hard and fast law. And in Taiwan, another scandal, as Moe's Burger a Japanese burger chain, is busted for using restricted Fukushima food in Taiwan. One of the sauce mixes used by the chain was labeled as being produced in Tokyo, but was actually produced in Tochigi Prefecture, one of the prefectures under food import restrictions. The company will be fined for false customs declarations by the Taiwanese government, but not for exposing its customers to the possibility of internal contamination by radionuclides. And the forest fire near Chernobyl that broke out over a week ago has spread radionuclides, notably plutonium, over eastern Europe, Asia, Alaska, and is now moving in over the west coast of the U.S. According to a simulation that uses actual winds, not predicted winds, Smoke particles from the Chernobyl fire have moved over southern Alaska, northern British Columbia, northwest Washington State, Salinas, Fresno, and Santa Barbara in California, and Las Vegas. As of Friday morning, May 5th, the rain outside of Fresno had some measure of this smoke plume mixed in with it and was falling as snow in the mountains to the northeast. There goes Sequoia. We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first... Nuclear radiation invisibly impacts our food, water, air, and as a result, our health. To help learn the best possible ways to protect from radiation's assault, I've worked with Kimberly Roberson, a veteran anti-nuclear activist and certified nutrition educator, 
to develop a program that explains the best practices we've been able to identify and verify to protect as best possible from radiation. It's called RAPT, which stands for Radiation Awareness Protection Talk. We have a free RAPT report available for nuclear hot seat listeners at raptawareness.com. That's R-A-P like Peter, T like Tom, awareness.com. When you sign up, you'll also receive regular email updates on food, water, and health issues, as well as products, services, and detoxification protocols that can help you protect yourself and your loved ones. To get your free report and start learning what you can do to best protect your health from radiation's negative impact, go to raptawareness.com. Dr. Celine Marie Pascal is an Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies, College of Arts and Sciences at American University in Washington, D.C., as well as Professor of Sociology and Affiliate Professor for the School of Communications. She studies language research to examine issues of culture, knowledge, and power. I first became aware of her and her work when ENENews.com ran a story about a paper she presented at the International Sociological Association's World Congress last year. She covered aspects of the media coverage of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster that those of us in this movement suspected and complained about But we couldn't prove it. She, however, did more than two years of analysis and came up with the data to prove the points, especially the framing of the concept of risk to people after Fukushima. I was very excited to track her down at her office in D.C. and interview her for this show. Celine Marie Pascal, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start out with giving the listeners a sense of your background. I'm a sociologist at American University, and I'm interested in issues of language and knowledge. I study language use to understand the kinds of assumptions that people make in their daily lives that often reproduce systems of inequality. What first got you interested in studying media coverage that took place in the wake of the start of the Fukushima nuclear disaster? I began noticing in my own casual reading that the media didn't cover the nuclear disaster in um, ways that I might have expected. And a little bit like what happened after Hurricane Katrina, that There was a way of reporting the natural disaster that really minimized what was going on and the social decisions that created the disaster itself around the levees. And so I wondered if something like that was happening with Fukushima, it seems like we weren't getting quite the whole story. From my perspective and that of people in the movement, we couldn't agree with you more. When did you start? turning this into research, and how did you proceed? Two years after the disaster, I began collecting newspaper articles, media coverage from the Huffington Post, Politico, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. I collected everything that they had printed about Fukushima in the two years between the start of my data collection, which was the second year anniversary and the beginning of the disaster. What specifically were you looking for or looking at? As a sociologist, what I do is a systematic study to identify patterns. So I came into it thinking that it would be very interesting to look at how risk was constructed. How did these various media construct the notion of risk and how did it get particular kinds of meaning. And that began a really long coding process that um, I used Envigo, which is a systematic online way of looking for where the word risk might appear or associated words and that going from there more deeply into the articles to understand how they were being used, what was the context of their use. So when you say you were looking for risk, you were actually searching for that word in the context of articles and news stories about Fukushima? Exactly. There is so much data here that 
What I wanted to focus on for the first article out of this data is just the construction of risk with regard to the general population. I was really surprised when I saw how rarely that was discussed in media. So I think that out of almost 2,200 articles just about, that there were really only 129 across all of these media that talked about risk to populations at all. That's shocking. The rest of it was risk to economies, risk to markets, risk to energy, but there were not really many articles at all that talked about the human aspect of this, except where workers were concerned. So it, it made it seem like if you were not a worker, you wouldn't be at high risk. And what was your understanding of the actual risk that the population faced as a result of this disaster? I'm not someone who studies nuclear energy, and I'm not an expert on radiation. So I'm coming at this in a very odd way. I understand that what happened at Fukushima was far more devastating than what happened at Chernobyl, but I don't have the expertise to say what the consequences of that would be. I can only tell you how media represent the potential consequences. So, for example, most of the articles that of that 129, 65 of them said, you know, the risk here is really low. You know, you are actually, and the New York Times ran an article saying, you're more at risk from radiation from rocks and cosmic rays from the environment than you are from anything happening at Fukushima. Well, you know, that's pretty shocking. That's, that's the kind of reporting that was going on. Of uh, the articles that said, well, you know, there's some slow risk here, but, you know, we can't really say that much about it. They compared the risk of cancer to walking through the x-ray machines at airports, right, that, that those were more dangerous than what was happening at Fukushima. One of the quotes that came from the article is that research shows that corporations and government agencies had disproportionate access to framing the event in the media. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when I look across all of these articles, and I look at who's being quoted and in what context. So most of the time, you could find quotes from government officials, from various corporations, but what you really missed were quotes from people on the ground, from anti-nuclear groups, from organizations that are generally more critical of nuclear power. What do you think was behind this being the chosen narrative? Did it feel to you like it may have been a top-down decision, an edict from management or even higher government saying, play this down? Do you think it was ignorance on the part of the reporters to find contrasting views? Where do you think the failure to communicate more the seriousness of the risk came from? I couldn't say that there is a single point at work here. It certainly isn't a top down. You know, in the U.S., we have a free media. You can report on whatever you want to report on. And yet, if you look at the dominant media outlets, they report the same stories in pretty much the same way every single day. You would think for that level of consistency that there was coercion somewhere. It doesn't work, that process in the U.S. doesn't work the same way that it might work in another country where there is literally a top-down coercive force. But rather, I think that it's a confluence of a lot of people who are involved in who have access to the media, how we think about it. So of these 129 articles, only three of them were critical about this discourse of minimal risk. Three. So we have an original group of over 2,100 articles, 2,200 almost, and out of those, three are critical of how it's being reported. That's pretty shocking. That happens without someone coming through and saying, this is what you have to do, right? There's, there's a whole different process at work when corporate media, and here we have Huffington and Politico included in this. I was thinking that there might be something um, much more edgy, more, more confrontational there. 
Yeah, but no, that wasn't the case. We do know from certain private channels that certainly there was pressure put on the United States and the U.S. agreed to downplay the story. That came from a trade agreement that Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State signed approximately one month after the disaster began. I've also heard from private contact that there was pressure put certainly on national public radio, and I can't say the specifics on it, but certainly the will of the government was made known that it needed to be downplayed and that there were certain pressures put on that made it difficult for the reports to come out in, shall we say, a less biased and a more focused on risk kind of a way. In one instance, I know the news reporter for an NPR station who was specifically told not to use the word fallout in connection with Fukushima. The word can only be used in connection with the repercussions of a political mistake that got made, like somebody showing their private parts on a cell phone photo. For those of us who are following the issue very closely and following the day-by-day, almost minute-by-minute progression of Fukushima in those early days, what was remarkable is that for about three days, there were a lot of reports in the U.S. media talking about the plume of radiation from Fukushima coming towards the United States, the West Coast, and that it was going to hit in approximately eight days. For about three days, we heard that story, and then it vanished. It was nowhere, the word plume was not used, and there was no discussion of radiation hitting the West Coast, even though we know from our own readings at the time that it did hit, and it was specifically very intense in the Seattle area, where people were getting hot particles that were coming across from Fukushima. But it did not appear in the media after the third day. So it was suspected that something came down. We just haven't been able to nail with multiple sources so that it can be reported in a larger way what it was that actually happened. Um, I certainly found articles that reported that radiation from Fukushima was found in Vermont, articles that tracked that across the country. So I have a different experience. I'm not seeing that there's a blackout of news, but rather it's minimized. It's like no consequence. In a capitalist society where you don't have a police force, we're not controlled by military force, we're controlled by a certain kind of knowledge production. Uh, it began with the PR industry after World War I. It is through a construction of public knowledge that we have public order of a particular kind. And that's why I'm very interested in issues of knowledge production and power. In the articles that I've looked at, they're talking about, you know, these things happening, but they say it doesn't really matter. And one of the ways they say it doesn't matter is that, well, there's no real science. There's no hard science out there that will show us that this is going to have a negative effect. Well, science is always open to debate. It's not a science isn't necessarily a field where certainties rule, but the consequences of radiation poisoning are pretty well known. It's not that difficult, even though we don't have necessarily the specifics that map precisely onto Fukushima. I also found that there was languaging that was included in the minimization to subliminally direct people away from paying further attention. They would say that there was no immediate danger, that there was no significant exposure, with the words immediate and significant being key to this. And in truth about immediate, it takes so long for radiation exposure to manifest as some kind of an illness in the body that, in essence, they were literally correct, but they were giving a false impression that there was no danger. Yes, yes. Did you find other languaging that was used consistently to turn people away from the disaster so that they weren't paying serious attention to it? Well, you as a reporter are able to infer a certain kind of intent, which I as a researcher can't do. So I'm not saying that they are reporting it this way in order to make people look another way 
what I can tell you is that when you report on things in particular ways, it minimizes the interest, or it, but I can't really say what their intent was here. Does that distinction make sense? Yes, it does. We're coming at okay. it from two, from two particular perspectives on it, and that's just fine. The study goes on to point out how political disasters are and the efforts that go into controlling the narrative and the information the public receives. How do you see that continuing with the coverage of Fukushima? I think that the struggle for political power is present in the way that most everything gets reported. So one of the things that the literature on this shows us is that the more that we know about disasters, you would think we would take fewer risks, but instead we end up increasing the numbers of risks that we take. We put ourselves at greater danger because the scale of risk-taking is increasing in leaps and bounds. So in the short, what happens is experts seem to have supplied a kind of confidence to take bigger risks. So the discursive production of risk in relationship to the general population relies on a kind of scientific uncertainty, and corporations and governments capitalized on this doubt about the presence of risk. And that results in a lot of ways to avoid responsibility. And of course, it's easy to ignore radiation and its impact because it can't be perceived with any of the senses, and its impact takes place over time so that the distance between cause and effect is so great it can be denied. Exactly. It's very, very hard to track. And also, there are specific forms of health problems. So if you're looking only at lung cancer, then it might not present very much of a risk. But if you think about diabetes, cataracts, heart problems that have come out of the studies from Chernobyl, then you're looking at something much more broad. And, of course, much more long-lasting because once the DNA is changed, once there's been genetic mutation, that's forever. Right. Right. So how has this study been disseminated, and has there been any effort to get it into the hands of decision-makers in the media? I presented a paper on this research in Yokohama, which is about 50 miles south of Fukushima. And the article that you've referenced was written about that conference presentation. I'm in the process now of finalizing an article. I've had requests from a couple of journals to publish it in different places. I haven't decided yet where to place it. And are any of these journals dealing with journalism, with the actual field of news coverage? No, they're not. But I work, I'm an affiliate with our School of Communication and talk frequently with faculty and students there about the production of knowledge in news reports. Just simple, how we pick language changes everything. Simple words make a huge difference. Yes, they do. In your work with the School of Communication, have you used Fukushima as an example yet in any of your presentations? This is a new research project for me. I have worked with them mostly on uh, representations of race in media. So if they or really anyone, I know our community would be very interested, would want to access the study, how might they go about doing so? Well, first I have to publish it. (laughs) (laughs) You mean we're getting the jump on the gun on this one? You are. Because the article that you noticed came from a report on a conference presentation, not on a printed document. That's where we got into, we're kind of in the circle yet. But it it will come out soon. When you say soon, can you give me an approximate month on this? Yes, within the year. Interesting, because I'm a member of Sigma Delta Chi, the Professional Journalism Society, and every year they have a conference. This is an in-gathering of news directors, reporters, cable, broadcast, satellite for 
all of the United States and Canada, and usually it works at the same time with the Spanish language stations as well. It's a joint conference that gets held. And there are more than 1,000 media decision makers and on-the-ground reporters who are there every year. I attended two years ago. I'm hoping to be able to attend this fall again on behalf of this movement. It would be fascinating if your work could be brought to their attention in advance so that perhaps it would be a topic of conversation. That would be very interesting. What I'm finding in the media here is no different from what I found when I did media studies of reporting on homelessness, that the same sets of principles are at work. In what way? When articles about people who can't afford housing talked about, well, they, they very rarely talked about people who can't afford housing. They talked about homeless or the homeless. They used a certain kind of language that became part of a discourse that removed people from the reality of the experience. And very, very rarely did they ever interview people who actually were unable to afford housing. Instead, they interviewed people who had housing about how they felt about people who don't have housing. That's a very peculiar way to report on a topic, and yet that is a standard reporting practice in the U.S. And how did that play out in the coverage of Fukushima? In Fukushima, I haven't finished my data analysis to say with definitiveness, but what I'm seeing is that there is a kind of group think in how all of these things are reported. So you had asked about articles that were critical, and there was one in the New York Times, one in the Huffington Post, and one in the Washington Post. So it's not like there's one media outlet that's charging ahead, but that there's a little piece in all of them. It's just that the massive amount of reporting is following the party line, so to speak. It would just be so fascinating if you could get something published and available. It's mid-September in Orlando if you can get yourself down there, or if not, at least make it available. Have there been any reporters or news directors or members of the mainstream media who have gotten back to you even after this small article appeared? Well, I've gotten a lot of feedback from bloggers and other scholars, but no, not from mainstream media. It's going to be interesting to see whether any kind of noise can be made around your study. It's certainly going to be picked up by our side of the hill. It'd be good to see if there's any kind of way to get it into the hands and the minds of those who are in charge of mainstream media to see if we can get better coverage because next year is the fifth anniversary. As you're probably aware, the media likes things that happen one year after and then it's in multiples of five. <laughs> and that's so logical. That's not covered for the years in between. Let's just go in five years. Right. right. So we've, we've got a real shot here. Do you have any thoughts to share that perhaps we have not gotten to? The single takeaway point for me is that all knowledge is it, a social process, right? And it's expressive of value judgments, of politics. There's a lot of contradiction in it. And that we have to look at all reporting as a, a construction of events. There is no such thing as news. We create news. And how we create that news, how we give events particular presence and meaning in our lives, is always a political struggle for power. That's my takeaway. Beautifully done. Celine Marie Pascal, thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Celine Marie Pascal, professor of sociology at American University in Washington, D.C. Her paper has not yet been published, but when it is, we will let you know and have a link up on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your donations to keep us going and growing. My deepest gratitude to those of you who donate when, how often, and as much as you can. I really have a soft spot in my heart 
for those of you who donate small amounts every month because I can count on it, I can count on you, and yes, it does make a real difference. If you find that Nuclear Hot Seat makes you think, helps you understand the nuclear issues, maybe gives you a laugh once in a while, and lets you not be so alone with your awareness of the nuclear issue, help us keep doing it. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red donate button. Whatever you can do to help. Merci, gracias, toda roba, and thank you. So, John Stewart, you finally do a nuclear story, but which one do you choose? The nuclear deal with Iraq, and you do so by interviewing Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz. I'm about to give up on you, mister. So many other nuclear stories to choose from. Such numbnutsery that you could just deal with scathingly with that incredible sense of humor and delivery of yours. And this is the one that you choose, and you do it very seriously. So look, you've only got until August 6th to get it right, John, because that's when you're leaving. At least that's what the latest releases say. So let's give it a go before it's too late. You never want to have regrets, and you only regret what you don't do, not what you actually do. So unless you really do plan on getting control of CNN from Rupert Murdoch and programming it in your image, we'll have another conversation then. But if not, Booby, we've got to speak now. Activist shout-outs? I love this one. Washington State Physicians for Social Responsibility is taking a tour of the Hanford site led by the Department of Energy. I don't know who pulled this off, but it is really cool. The tour will take place on June 4th from 7.30 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon. They will be traveling over the day before and will meet for dinner in Richland, that's the town adjacent to it, on the evening of the 3rd to talk a little about Hanford and what to expect on the tour. Ooh, I do hope you have your bullet-pointed questions and talking points prepared so you can really slam into these guys. And don't be afraid to take audio at the same time. I'd love to hear what's being said. The tour is free. They could have used it as a big fundraiser, but they want to make sure that people are there, so it's no cost to you. Space is extremely limited, so you need to RSVP to daniel at wpsr.org. Or if you're up in the area, you can call the office at 206-547-2630. Just to give you an idea of the itinerary, it's going to include Hanford's 300 area, where uranium was fabricated into fuel rods. The nine nuclear reactors in the 100 area, located along the Columbia River, where fuel rods were irradiated to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. Mm -mm -mm. Visitors will also have a guided walking tour of the historic B reactor, the world's first full-scale plutonium production reactor. Oh, do bring your dosimeter batches and your radiation meters with you on this tour. And don't forget to take your liquid zeolite to get it out of your body. And then soak in a tub with powdered zeolite in it to get anything out of your body that might have gotten there. They'll tell you that it's safe, but listeners to this show know that one of the major tanks of plutonium-contaminated waste has already eaten through one of its containment shells, and that the workers on the site regularly get ill. So you'll only be there for a short time, but hey, we need you guys around for a long time. Take care of yourselves out there, you hear? And for those of you listening who could use a little bit of a laugh, I will have up on the site a clip I was sent from the Mork and Mindy show a gazillion years ago. It has the late Robin Williams as Mork getting off a job where he was protecting a leak at a nuclear facility when he learns that, unlike on his home planet, there's no way to mitigate against the radiation. An amazing two-minute clip. I mean, it was no big deal, really. I mean, I just stood there for a couple of hours, and some people came and relieved me from my guard duty, and I came home. Well, how was your day? Uh, I don't 
know how you can be so casual about this, Mork. But you must have misunderstood what was going on. I mean, there's so many safeguards against radiation leaks. Man, I mean, it's no big deal. I mean, on Ork, whenever we have a nuclear accident, we just use nuke away. <laughs> nuke away? Well, yeah, it comes in pine scent or that exciting new fragrance, fusion. I mean, <laughs> it, it takes the worry out of being radioactive. No, we don't have anything like nuke away here on Earth. Well, then how to get rid of telltale nuclear waste? We don't. Oh, come on, man. You can't tell me people with nuclear power don't have any way of disposing the waste. Now, come on. Hey, I mean, next thing you're going to tell me is you're going to put it in cans, right? We do. You do? Yeah, yeah. You do? Whoa! We got to get out of here, man. Come on. We got to take a quick hike. We're going to take the next egg out. Don't worry about packing your clothes. We're getting some of your Frederick Savinas. Come on, let's go. We can't just leave. If what you say is true, there are thousands of people that can be in danger. I mean, we got to tell somebody. I'll tell you what. As we fly out, we'll drop some pamphlets and say, trespass beware or you go bald. Now, let's go. <laughs> to notify the authorities. Well, there's one minor hang-up with that, Min. What? Well, the Air Force is the authority. <laughs> See, it's kind of like Catch-44. It's like Catch-22, except twice as bad. <laughs> well, we gotta tell somebody. I mean, the people have a right to know things like this. I mean, they just can't get away with covering this thing up. Who's covering it up? I mean, Nixon's been gone for a long time. <laughs> I don't know. Probably the company that owns the dump. Well, why would they want to cover it up? Well, they usually say it's because they don't want people to panic. Oh, I see. What they don't know won't hurt them until it does. Mark calling Orson. Come in, Orson. Mark calling Orson. Come in, Orson. Mark calling Orson. Come in, Orson. Hello, Mark. What's new? Well, no, no, sir. It's, it's what's nuke. All right, Mark. What's nuke? It's short for nuclear. See, this week, sir, I, I had a job guarding a leak at a nuclear dumping site. Guarding it from whom, Mark? Well, the people who live near the dump. It was very hush-hush. Why was that? Well, governments on Earth like to play a game. It's called, I've got a secret. But when it comes time to tell the truth, it's, let's make a deal. Sounds like they don't want to burden the public with too much information. Yeah, but Orson, how can you prepare for the rain if you don't know what the weather forecast is? See, I believe people have the right to know everything that might affect their well-being. Maybe there's a good reason, Mort. Isn't there an Earth saying that ignorance is bliss? Oh, not in this case, sir. You see, it's a good thing to conserve energy, but it's a bad thing to keep people in the dark. Now, I have some specific information I'd like to relate. Whoa. Until next week. Nanu, Nanu. And my thanks to Kevin Lynn of KLL Productions for sending it to me. Here's today's final thought. We've just come through Nuclear Anniversary Alley, a confluence of remembrances for Fukushima, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and now the whip site accident in Carlsbad. But before you say, phew, or maybe that's just me because each one of these was a special on Nuclear Hot Seat, realize that next year provides us with a major opportunity for mainstream media coverage. It will have been 40 years since Chernobyl, and five years since Fukushima. The media will be forced to pay attention if only because both of these numbers are divisible by five. Now you can bet the other side, the pro new consortium already has volumes of talking points and nasty little programs figured out to dominate the discourse in the media, just as Professor Celine Marie Pascal explained in today's interview. So let's not let them get away with it. Activists from all over, this is a shout out to all of you. What are your best ideas for actions, demonstrations, campaigns, programs, zaps, concerts, or other events? What's the best use we can get out of social media? How do we build awareness? How can we coordinate our actions around the world? to create a united presence that the mainstream media will not be able to avoid or erase by its bad focus in their coverage. The time to think about and start planning our actions is right now. We have to be active, not reactive. We're going to need a logo or logos, slogans, talking points, actions, and I'm sure there's tons of stuff I'm not even imagining right now. So if you, yes, you, you the person hearing this right now, if you have any ideas to propose, send them in to me in an email at info at nuclearhotseat.com. Please, not Facebook, 
I lose stuff on Facebook. Send it to the email. That sticks around forever. Not unlike the radiation from plutonium. Let's prepare our battle plans, our peaceful battle plans now. That's what the pro-nukers are doing. So let's not let them get away with controlling the conversation and the information flow anymore. Okay? Okay. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, May 12th, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, Fox New York, WPIX, CNN, CBS New York, WABC, Journal News, Courtland.dailyvoice.com, Counterpunch and Carl Grossman's excellent article on Indian Point, PressOfAtlanticCity.com, USNews.com, WashingtonTimes.com, GrandCanyonTrust.org, ReviewJournal.com, Arnie Gunderson and Fairwinds.com, also .org, Colorado State University, CTVNews.ca, WHYY, Smithsonian, Evacuate-Fukushima.com, FukuLeaks.org, OptimalPrediction.com, Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, the Judas Goats at World Nuclear News, and the ever-lovely folks in the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts or just check us out on the website, nuclearhotseat.com. Also, our YouTube channel carries the show as Nuclear Hot Seat videos. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015. Lee B. Halady and Hardestry Communications, all rights reserved but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Lee B. Halady of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Physicians for Social Responsibility is running a Nuke Busters film competition, and you can win $5,000 if you get your films in by July. So get them up right now. And we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.